The man was born blind and now he sees. His parents are taken to task and they're unwilling to stand by their son and they don't want to be known as associates of Jesus. They don't want to be known as those who confess that Jesus is the Messiah because then they would lose their place in the synagogue. They would lose their spots in the country club. They wouldn't be able to play squash with anybody. They'd be kicked off the golf course. They'd lose their Twitter followers. They wouldn't get the promotion. They'd lose their good standing online. People might blog mean things about them, what have you. In our context, it's about what it's like. And so they say, ask him, he's of age. So they totally hang their son out to dry. Rather than standing by him and saying, he says that Jesus healed him, we believe that Jesus healed him. They say, please don't take us to task over this. Just corner our son, <laughs> who apparently can see now. Here's what happens when they bring the man forward again. John chapter 9, verse 24. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. You see that in the past tense? You can't call him the blind man anymore and told him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I can see. So they tell him, give glory to God. This is something you see in the book of Joshua. You see this in the book of Jeremiah. This is a solemn charge to tell the truth. In the American context, it's like, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Okay, that's sort of what's being evoked here. Give glory to God. We know that this man, meaning Jesus, is a sinner. And then this man's response is so perfect. He has just been confronted publicly and is told, give glory to God, which is quite ironic. We know that Jesus is a sinner. And then what he says is, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Now, he has not yet met Jesus with his own seeing eyes. This man's story of having been born blind, having been miraculously caused to see, and then after faithfully standing by Jesus, sees Jesus is one beautiful microcosm of the macrocosm of how salvation works. Jesus smears mud on the man's eyes and tells him to go wash in the pool at Siloam. Now, Siloam, interestingly enough, was the pool at Siloam was discovered as recently as 2004 when they were uh, fixing a broken water main uh, in Jerusalem. They discovered the pool of Siloam. And it was uh, the word Siloam means sent. So don't miss this. He is born blind. And his disciples ask him, who sinned? Was it him? Was it his parents? Could have been his parents. They didn't stand up very well on trial. Who sinned so this man was born blind? This is a part of the Aiden's Hope curriculum, by the way. JesseCampbellMinistries.com, go to Aiden's Hope. This was part of my doctoral thesis, answering the question, what happens to babies when they die? Do infants go to heaven? How do we know that biblically? All right, what happened? Why, why was this man born afflicted? And Jesus' answer is clear. He, neither this man nor his parents sinned. This was done so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So this man, born blind, has mud smeared on his eyes, and then he is sent to Siloam. You see kind of a picture of baptism there as he is washed clean. And then he has not seen Jesus yet, but he is now standing on trial testifying to Jesus. Then after the fact, he's going to encounter Jesus. Just like you and I, we were born broken. We were born fractured by the fall. We were born with a sin nature. We were born depraved. But then Jesus, right there in our muddiness, sends us out. An encounter with Jesus is everything. And now, having been baptized, having walked in repentance from sin, having washed clean, now we testify to others, even if we're outnumbered, even if our own parents forsake us, we're going to tell people about Jesus. And then one day, one beautiful, sweet, blessed, amazing day, Christian, you will see Jesus. You used to be blind, but that day you will see. This is a testimony that is undeniable. Look, I used to be stuck in sin, and now all I want to do is walk in repentance. And when I mess up, when I did you hear me say when, bloggers? <laughs> when I mess up, all I want to do is repent and just make it right. I'm walking repentance after that. That's a miracle of God. Look, all I know is this. I was blind, but now I see. No monkey skull that's dug up in the desert has any bearing whatsoever on your personal encounter with Christ, even though you haven't seen him yet. You know for a fact that you should be lost in your sin. And now because of Jesus, you can see. Look, 
All I know is this, I used to be stuck in sin and now I see. I used to be blind, but now I see. No one will ever be able to dissuade you of that. Your personal testimony is irrevocable proof of the veracity of the gospel because you're a fundamentally different person now than you were before. You remember your old sinful self and you regret it when you step back into those ways. You were blind, but now you see. So come what may, say what you will. I've encountered Jesus. He's changed my life forevermore. This means you don't need a master's degree in apologetics to defend your faith. You just need to know your story. You used to be blind, but now because of Jesus, you see. So encapsulate your version of the same kind of testimony, your life before Christ, how you came to know Christ, what your life has been like since Christ. You used to be blind, but now you see. No one, no one, no one can strip you of that testimony and no one will ever convince you otherwise. It is your testimony and it's a beautiful story about the truthfulness of the gospel. So use it and light up the darkness today.